right, one more time, let's give the Lord a big hand clap of praise here. Yes, yes. You know, this is a, a very uh, special Sunday, especially here at Ascension Life. I mean, we got so much going on. For example, we're going to be doing communion here shortly. I'm excited about that. Anytime we do communion, uh, it's something that's very special here at Ascension Life, especially when we do it on Sunday mornings. And typically, we do that around Easter and sometimes around Christmas, but uh, we are going to be doing that, and I'm so excited about that, looking forward to that. And then again, maybe we should have been building an ark this morning. But, uh, but anyway, we're here, and I know there's a lot of water out there, but uh, we're here. And here's the thing, in our, Brian mentioned it, in our uh, second meeting today, our 11 o'clock meeting, uh, we're going to be doing a baby dedication. Now check this out. We're dedicating 17 babies. <laughs> 17 babies, and actually it could have even been more. Now, you know, uh, it was two years ago last that we did a, a baby dedication. I think we did three then, and of course we missed last year. I mean, it was just a pandemic, that's all. So, you know, we, you know, we, we, missed, we missed last year. And I don't know, we, we had several parents coming up to us and saying, hey, uh, you know what, we want to get our baby dedicated. We, we, we need to do a baby dedication because it's been, I mean, our, our child's getting older here. And we're like, okay, we're going to do it. And, and I just kind of, and, and I admit there was a little procrastination there. And finally one day Julie said, Daryl, just pick a date. Pick a date let's do it. So about two and a half weeks ago I picked a date. And uh, didn't put a lot of thought into it. Didn't, you know, I'm thinking, okay, we might have seven or eight babies. Um, uh, as the, you know, once we announced it within just a few days, we had, we had 17 going on 20. So again, that's an incredible, that's a blessing and a half. So one more time, let's, let's thank the Lord for that. The Bible says that children are a heritage unto the Lord and that they're a blessing. So what a blessing it is that we as a church, that we get to do that today. So please be in prayer for us that we can manage that this morning. We're going to have them all lined up up here and sitting, and I'm going to be speaking directly to them, and that our babies will be uh, patient and, and, and give us, the, you know, give us the, the grace to be able to get through the service. But uh, we're going to do it, and it's going to be awesome. And again, like Brian said, thank you for those of you who normally come on uh, Sunday mornings for the second service, but you chose to come here to help give us some seats because... The feedback we've gotten so far is it's going to be a really good crowd. But who knows? I mean, like I said, I mean, there's a lot of rain out there, okay? It's been raining pretty hard. But we'll see. looks like you guys, you overcame. You're here, so don't worry. You'll make the rapture, okay? Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> Somebody said yes. Uh, but, you know, as pertaining to this particular day, this is a, a very special day for both Jews and Christians. For the Jewish people, today is Passover Sunday. And it officially began last night with the Jewish people sitting down together with their families and celebrating the Passover meal or the, the Passover Seder. And, you know, they'll go throughout the week. It's a seven-day celebration. I don't know if you know that there's three major feasts in Judaism. There's Passover, there's Pentecost, and there's Tabernacles. Passover is the most important of the three, and that's taking place this week. And so this entire week is going to be a time of solemn reflection and celebration of what God did for them. You know, when, they, when the children of Israel were in bondage in Egypt, how God mightily delivered them out of the bondages of Pharaoh in Egypt. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But that's what they're doing. They're celebrating that this week. And today is, a, you know, if you check the calendars, it'll say Passover Sunday, depending on the calendar you look at. And for the Christians, today is Palm Sunday, okay? And, and, I, and I learned something this week. I was talking to some people because we were discussing about how the services were going to go. And, and I think I said something like, yeah, yeah, we're doing this on Palm Sunday. And I actually had some people say to me, Palm Sunday? What's Palm Sunday? Christians saying this. And it, I forgot that a lot of us nowadays weren't raised in traditional or liturgical type churches. I was. And so it's, you know, Palm Sunday. I always know that the Sunday before Easter is Palm Sunday. When I was, when I was a kid in the church I was going to, I was raised Catholic. And there was one Palm Sunday I'll never forget. It, it's still one of those things that I remember as a kid. We had the coolest priest. He had long, long hair. 
He wore sandals and he, and he, and he rode a Harley Davidson motorcycle. This was like late 60s, early 70s. And I'm like, I'm like 9, 10, 11 years old, something like that. And, I, I mean, and he was the coolest guy. He'd come out on the playground and he'd, you know, all the kids go running up to him. He's a, he's a great guy. And this guy actually, he had, there were services he preached our kind of messages that they would do additional services. Uh, th- this guy was awesome. But there was this one Palm Sunday where they handed out palm branches and he led the church outside, the congregation outside the church, and we went marching down the road, waving our palm branches, following him. And, uh, and you know, and being a kid that little in those days, having to sit for an hour on wooden pews, you know, some of you can relate. Some of you that's been going here and this is one of your first churches, you, you don't know what it's like to sit for an hour on a hard wooden pew, okay? And, and not only that, you got to be quiet. See, you got to be quiet. I don't know how many times my mom smacked my hand or my leg or my cheek. And I mean a big wham. You know, I don't, I, some of us have no clue what it was like, like back in the day. But anyway, uh, but anyway, you know, as a kid being able to get up and get out of church and, and go down the road waving a palm branch, that was like, yes, that was pretty exciting. So anyway... You know, yeah. So, so Palm Sunday is always something I, you know I can easily uh, relate to and know that it's the Sunday before uh, before Easter. But what is Palm Sunday? Palm Sunday is the day that traditionally uh, the church celebrates Jesus's triumphant entry into Jerusalem. Now, what's so important about that? There's a lot important about it. So if you're ever reading in the Gospels, and it's, all, it's in all four of the Gospels, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but Jesus is riding uh, on a white donkey coming into Jerusalem was a fulfillment of Scripture because Scripture, I think it's Zechariah, says this, that the Messiah King, the King of Peace, would come riding in on a white donkey, and it even talks about the, the path he'll be taking. And Jesus was coming right in line of that, coming down from uh, from the Mount of Olives by the way of Bethpage coming into Jerusalem. And now check this out. This is what it said prophetically. That as he entered into the city, that they would be uh, singing shouts of praises, quoting Psalm 118. And this is what they were saying. Barach Habas Shem Adonai. Somebody said, wow. He said that. But you know what they were singing and what they were saying? Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Jesus was entering into Jerusalem as the Messiah King and they were welcoming him. Now think about this. He's coming into Jerusalem, the capital city of Judaism the seat of authority for Judaism. And yet, Jesus is coming into Jerusalem at the shouts and praises of the people and they're declaring Him to be the Messiah King. It is a powerful picture of what's going on. And you know, I used to think about this and I just, I've just learned this recently because I, I love types and shadows. I love symbolism. And you know, and, and when you're reading in the Old Testament, let me just encourage you in this. It's not just a history lesson. The Old Testament is made up of types and shadows, symbolism. And yes, it does give us a true history of what happened with the children of Israel and their relationship with God and so forth and this and that. But it also points to the future. It points to Jesus. I can tell you this. I don't care which book you're reading, whether it's Genesis all the way through Malachi, you can see Jesus in the Old Testament. Everything in the Old Testament points to Jesus. And so is Jesus coming into Jerusalem? That's a fulfillment. It's a fulfillment there. It's, it's just it, it's amazing. But, but here's the thing. I used to read this and I'm like, why a donkey? And if you read the King James Version, I won't, I mean, you know what the King James Version says, right? It doesn't say donkey. That word has kind of over time kind of become a little bit more derogatory, right? The A double S thing there uh, came riding in on a A double S. All right, but uh, but anyway, 
But here's the thing. The reason that it had to be that way in fulfillment of Scripture, because he was coming into Jerusalem as the king of peace, and a donkey represents peace. He wasn't going to ride a, a white horse at that time because he was coming in as the king of peace to initiate and, and usher in the kingdom of, of righteousness. But also, he was coming in to go to the cross to bring about the great reconciliation as Jehovah Shalom, the, the God of peace, who's going, to, who's going to bring about peace, peace between God and man. Did you know that? That the animosity between God and man was going to be removed at the cross. And he was bringing in and ushering in a, a dispensation of peace. Everybody say peace. peace. So that's why he came riding in on a, a donkey, a white donkey. But church, there's a day coming when he's not coming back on a donkey. Revelation says he's coming back riding a white horse. And a horse is symbolic of war. And he's coming back, the Bible says, with fire in his eyes, a, a sword in his hand. It's not the king of peace who's coming the next time he comes back. It's going to be the God of war that's coming to render the final judgment. And here's the good news. For those of us who are born again, those of us who are Christians, who are washed in the blood, we've been delivered from that. <laughs> we've been delivered from that. You know, that's not what our plight is all about. We get to spend eternity in heaven with Christ Jesus, sitting at his feet, worshiping the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. In fact, there's going to be a great gathering where we're going to gather with him. Amen. Whew. That's amazing. That's awesome. And so when we think about Palm Sunday, Palm Sunday is the day for Christians where, yes, we... we reflect and we celebrate his triumphant entry into Jerusalem but we also it initiates the week of where we focus on the upcoming week and looking forward to what happens at the end of this week but it begins first we you know we look at the different events the last supper we'll talk about that in just a second there's the last supper then there's Gethsemane the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, this is a message in and of itself. This would be a great Easter message if we truly understand and know what Gethsemane is all about. Gethsemane means, it means the place of crushing. Now, get this picture. Here you've got Jesus with his disciples going into the Garden of Gethsemane. The place of crushing. But interestingly, he has the majority of his disciples to stay in one place and he goes off into another solitary place taking with him Peter, James, and John, his inner circle. And he goes in this place, and <laughs> I, could, I could spend some time talking about why he picked them and why he needed them to be with him at this time because I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but Jesus, when he went into Gethsemane, entered into the battle of battles. If you've ever seen the movie The Passion, and if you haven't seen it, I encourage you to get it and watch it. Somehow get it and watch it this week. And if you've seen it in the past, watch it again. Because that is an excellent movie, a wonderful making of what Jesus experienced, what he suffered. But when Jesus was in the garden, this is what was going on. He was battling with the devil. It was a major battle. It was a war and a half going on. You may not read that. You may not see that when you're reading in the Scripture. But there was a battle going on. No differently than another garden in times past when Adam was in conflict with the devil. In one garden, the first Adam lost the battle. But not in this garden. In the <laughs> there was a garden where the battle was lost. There's another garden where the battle was won. See, here's what was going on in Gethsemane. The, the, the enemy, the, uh, the devil, Satan, was hitting him with everything he had. Here's, you know, and, and I want you to understand, this is how the devil works. This is what he was hitting Jesus with. you got to be crazy. Why are you going to the cross? Because you've got you to remember, Jesus was born to die. He knew exactly what he was going to do. 
He knew what his purpose was. So here's the devil. His last ditch effort to keep Jesus from going to the cross. And here's the devil hitting him saying, this is ridiculous. Why are you going to the cross? Why are you going to go die for these people? you got to be kidding me. They're not worth it, Jesus. Judas is get, getting ready to betray you right now. Peter is going to deny you. The disciples, all your followers are going to walk away from you. The people who welcome you in to Jerusalem, the great fanfare of blessings and shouting and declaring blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord are going to turn on you and they're going to spit it in your face. They're going to laugh at you. They're going to mock at you. Why are you doing it, Jesus? It's not worth it. You don't have to do it for these people. These people aren't worth it. But you know what Jesus did? He remembered what his purpose was. He remembered what his assignment was. And at that moment, he said, Not my will, but thy will be done, O God. And at that moment, he stomped the devil's head. And here's the thing. That's why, I mean, I love, I love the movie The Passion because it's so eloquently and so, I mean, <laughs> it works it into the passion. And from that moment, you see, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> to make something aware right now. You know, we talk about the victory of the cross. The victory was won in the garden. The victory was won in the garden because at that moment he stood up and he had the power and the authority and the resolve to carry that victory to the cross. Nothing was going to hinder him at that moment. Because he was completely and totally surrendered to the Father. You know what? <laughs> you want to walk in victory? You know, a lot of times I, I love to talk about authority and, and being able to, to understand and know the Word of God, to exercise the Word of God. But I'm going to tell you, the key to victory is surrender. To the degree that we humble ourselves before God is to the degree that he lifts us up. That's Scripture. That's something the church has gotten away from. See, it don't fit the modern day message. The church I got saved in 20 something years ago, a regular song that we sang was I Surrender All. How often do you hear a song like that today? Because <laughs> it's foreign to this generation, because many of us are Americanized Christians. <laughs> it's a much different focus. But the message of the cross, when Jesus said, come follow me, it came with a stipulation. Deny self. Lay your life down. Give it all up. Give it all up. Jesus' Jesus's message was all or nothing. Today's message is have what you want to have and follow him. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus gave it all up. And he said, not my will, but thy will be done, O oh God. And he was able to go straight to the cross through all that. What Isaiah said uh, in fulfilling the prophecies of Isaiah, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And by his stripes we are healed. Healed. Healed of what? Healed of the sin disease. Healed of the sin disease. And he did that for us at the cross. So, looking at this week and, and realizing that this whole week is in preparation of this coming Sunday. Which we're going to come in here this coming Sunday. And we're going to come in here with the victory that he's given us. We're going to come in here with the excitement and the enthusiasm. And we're going to rejoice because our Lord and Savior will not any longer be in the grave. Yes, he died. He died on the cross. And yes, he was buried. But on the third, on the third day, he did what? He rose again. And now every Easter, or every Resurrection Sunday, we celebrate that. And I'm really looking forward to this Sunday because we're going to, you know, typically in the past, we've did com uh, communion on Easter Sunday, most Sundays. But you know what? 
we're, we're going to do a salvation message. In fact, Brian has got an awesome message that he's going to be preaching in both services this coming Sunday for Easter Sunday. And we're believing for a harvest. So I'm saying that to you now to be in prayer with us this week. Be in prayer for us that with his message, we're going to pack this altar with people rededicating, you know, people who've been backslid, whatever, you know, not coming to church, living their life, you know. We're going to be believing that there's going to be a lot of people who are backslid going to come back to Jesus. We're going to believe that we're going to be believing that people are going to get radically saved this coming Sunday. So please be in agreement with us. Be in prayer with us. And you know what? Invite somebody. This is a great opportunity. Bring someone that you know that is not in church, someone that maybe you think is, you know, backslid. Bring someone who's not saved. Bring them this Sunday. And if it's packed, if it's so packed we don't have enough seats, those of us who are regular attendees, we'll give them our seats and we'll stand and we'll rejoice. That's coming this Sunday. But what, what is it? What is it that made this possible? What is it that made salvation possible? What is it that has brought about such a great salvation, such a great redemption, a great deliverance? Well, I want to go back. Real quick, and I want to look at the book of Exodus here. I want, to, I want to talk just a little bit about Passover. And I want to talk about the Last Supper. And I want you to see the connection here, the importance of these two events. So I'm in Exodus, uh, Exodus chapter 12. Let's look at this, starting with verse 21. And this is what God instituted. It says, Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said to them, Pick out and take lambs for yourselves according to your families and kill the Passover lamb. And you shall take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lentil and the, lentil and the doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning. For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians and when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over. Everybody say Passover. The Lord will pass over the door and not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to strike you. Hold on to that. And then in verse 24 it says this, And you shall observe this thing as an, uh, an ordinance for you and your sons forever. Here's the instruction. After this day, after this night, this particular celebration, this feast will be continued every year, every year throughout your generations. And there's a reason. I'm going to explain that in a second. And then verse 25 says, And it will come to pass when you come to the land which the Lord will give you, just as He promised. God keeps His promises. He says that you shall keep this service. You shall keep this Passover meal. Today it's mainly called Seder. He says you shall keep it year after year, generation after generation. You shall keep this. And then he says, verse 27, that you shall say it is the Passover sacrifice of the Lord. I like thinking of it as the Passover blessing. Who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians and delivered our households. Now this is a short synopsis here of the Passover event. you got to really read a number of chapters in Exodus to grasp what's going on. So I'm going to suggest another movie real quick if you feel led to do it, especially if you've never seen it, because I'm sure it's going to be showing tonight on some TV station. And that's the Charlton Heston Ten Commandments. That's a great movie, church. Oh, I know it's 1956, something like that, and I know it's dated in, in a lot of its ways, but I want you to know something. I did a lot. I love to research. I'm a researcher, and I did some study on this because I was that movie, when I was a kid, the first time I watched that movie, and I know because I've had people say, Pastor, there's no way the younger generation is going to watch it. It's a four-hour-long movie. They, they, they can't sit through your, your message. Well, you know what? When I was a kid, I had similar excuses. It would come out around spring, obviously, Easter time. Well, in my day, we went fishing. We played basketball. We played baseball. I mean, I didn't... St 
You know, the difference between my generation, and I'm not trying to be critical, this younger generation wants to sit down on the couch or on the bed with their telephone, or telephone, their cell phone, and their, as I just gave my age away. Have you seen those videos where the kids today try to operate a phone from 40 years ago? <laughs> well, you, you should know what our parents had to use. You ever seen Red Skelton? Uh, <laughs> anyway, I mean, you know, I, I can remember my parents, uh, I, I guess maybe it was my mother, was, she's like, hey, the Ten Commandments are on. You guys need to come in and watch it. I'm like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay out here and, and play baseball or something like that. You know, play outside. But I, I remember uh, one of the first times I ever watched it, guys, it gripped me. I know it's a little lengthy, it's a little, but even then, it, it got my attention. And watching that entire movie, it sowed some seed that I know played a, 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 a role in my coming to, to know Jesus. Now, here's the thing real quick about this movie and why I really encourage it. Is that, I don't know if you know this or not that the producer of this movie, his name is Cecil B. DeMille. It's the last movie he made before he died. And he was purposed to do this movie in honor of God. If you watch the credits, the very, le- the, the very last credit that comes up, it says, to the Holy Scriptures. He also reached out to scholars and researchers because he wanted to make sure... Because, you know, uh, yes, is there some Hollywood play right in it? Of course. But he also wanted to bring some of the other elements in that he had taken from, from Jewish historians, like, for example, Josephus, some scholars. Uh, there's things from rabbinical writings, uh, historically speaking, that's put into the movie. But here's, here's what really is kind of uh, enlightening, is that he got the idea for this movie when he was in a church and he had a vision of making this movie. He had a vision of making this movie in a church. And when I read that, I'm like, (laughs) yeah, God's hand of approval is on this movie. And I'll just say, just, uh, you know, just with a little fun here, you know, I know that there's been a number of Ten Commandment type movies that's come out since then, some kind of cartoonish, others. But this this is another reason why I like to say watch this particular movie. Because they paid attention to the semantics. That scene where Moses goes up the mountain and he has this, he has this dialogue with God is really right on the money of the meaning of those words. When God says, Moses. You watch some of these modern ones? Well, hey, Moses. How are you doing today? I've been waiting on you. So good. So glad you came today. And then there's one that's like this. Well, hey, Moses, give me a break. I can tell you the Ten Commandments I watched put the fear of God in me. And that's not a bad thing for people who aren't saved. It's not a bad thing for anybody. In fact, maybe the church needs a little bit coming back to the fear of the Lord. And that is New Testament. Don't tell me it's not. I can show you there's plenty of places where that's mentioned in the New Testament. So anyway, so in understanding this Passover story, and you can really get a good idea from the Ten Commandments, but in understanding the Passover story, you know, you understand that the instruction was to take the Passover lamb, kill the Passover lamb, take the blood of the Passover lamb, and put it on, check it out, put it on the doorposts and the lentils. To take the blood... And put it on the doorposts and the lentils. Anybody getting the picture now? It was, it was literally the forming and the making of a cross. Did you know when the children of Israel went out into the desert after they left Egypt? And, they, and when Moses was, went up the mountain with the elders and he looked out, the camps were set in a certain order. Did you know that? Each tribe had to be set up in a certain order. And from the higher point on the mountain and looking into the valley, you know what it looked like? Right there. A cross. <laughs> so they, had, they were instructed to take the Passover lambs, take them. And they had to inspect the Passover lamb. It had to be without spot, blemish, or wrinkle, no broken bones. It had to be a perfect lamb. 
Do you know who the lamb represents? Do you remember what John the Baptist said when he first saw Jesus? He said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's how John recognized him other than the part that says, He who comes after me, hey, the, the sandals I'm wearing, no, 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 no. Hey, his, I'm not even worthy to wear because he's coming to baptize you with Holy Ghost and fire. But he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That lamb, that, that instruction to kill that lamb was a type of the Jesus that was to come. But even in this example, the taking of that blood, which would represent Jesus' blood, putting it on the doorpost and the door, the door lentils. Check this out. When God sent the death angel, when the death angel was, was, was going to come to bring destruction, which represents death, eternal death, eternal punishment. Remember, God said, you got to put this on the doorpost and the lentils because when I see the blood, when I see the blood, I'll pass over. Remember that. When I see the blood, I'll pass over. And in understanding this picture, the ten plagues that God pours out, I don't know if you know this or not, but all ten of those plagues were purposed to defeat an Egyptian god. Those were ten different Egyptian gods that God was pouring His plagues out on to show that He was more powerful than their gods and to show the children of Israel that He was more powerful than their gods. And the last plague, if you remember, was the plague that was going to take all the firstborn of Israel. And, they, and, if, and, if, and if any family, any household did not have the blood on the doorpost and the door lintels, then the firstborn of that household would die. Now what a lot of people don't realize is that Pharaoh was, in Egypt, Pharaoh was a god. And so if Pharaoh's firstborn is going to die, that means the future god of Egypt would die. I'll, here's something else to think about. Most of you probably seen a picture of what the pharaohs of Egypt look like. Their, their, their headdress. Did you know the, the element that held the headdress in place? There was a snake wrapped around the head of Pharaoh. And in the front were two heads. It was a two-headed like looking serpent. One was a vulture and the other was like the cobra. The vulture represented death. Spirit of death. The serpent represented, check it out, sin. Pharaoh held the children of Israel in bondage to, a, to the spirit of sin and death. To the power of sin and death. They were in bondage to Pharaoh who's a type of Satan. Satan who comes with the power of sin and death. And he held, Pharaoh held the children of Israel in that bondage. And so the instruction to the Israelites every year to put the blood on the doorposts and littles and to do it every generation, generation after generation, had, it came with a purpose. It wasn't just to remind them of what God had done for them, but church it was purposed to tell them of something that was going to happen in the future. Because there was a day coming when there was going to be the perfect Lamb of God who was going to come and break the power of sin and death over the world. And that perfect Lamb would be Jesus. Here's something else to think about. See, I love types and shadows. I love that the Old Testament... When I read the Old Testament now, I see Jesus. When Jesus was coming into Jerusalem on that day, Palm Sunday as we call it, riding that white donkey, did you know on that same day was the day that the Passover or Paschal shepherds were leading the Passover lambs into Jerusalem for sacrifice? The same road, the same route. <laughs> did you know that? Jesus was the perfect Lamb of God, and not only was He the perfect Lamb of God, He was the perfect sacrifice. And then He goes to the cross. I want to read this as we close, and then we're going to do communion here. I want to go to the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 22. Check this out. And this is Jesus sitting down with His disciples. And what we know as the Last Supper, and what we know as communion... Some, some 
prefer to use the term Last Supper. Some prefer to use the term communion. In all reality, what Jesus was celebrating with his disciples was the Passover meal. In fulfillment and in obedience to what God had said. Do this generation after generation. So look at this. It says, Then when the hour had come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. And then he said to them, With fervent desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And then he took the cup and he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, gave thanks and broke it. And he gave it to them saying, now here it is, saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now interestingly, God's instruction to, instructions to the Israelites, they were to do this in remembrance of what he had done for them. And then it says, likewise, he also took the cup after supper saying, the cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. If I can get the worship team up here. Jesus is sitting down with his disciples whom he loved was a fulfillment of the ultimate Passover meal. The ultimate Passover message. And he was declaring to them the ultimate Passover blessing. Just as the children of Israel were obedient to the word of God, were obedient to the instruction of God to take the blood and put it on the doorposts and the door lintels. And if they would do that, that they would be delivered from the death angel. Those who were obedient to trust in the word, those who did that, were delivered from the death angel. What Jesus was basically saying in the Last Supper is this. I am laying my life down. And, and, and I honestly believe that they had... That they understood that he was coming to be the Passover lamb. But regardless of whether they did or didn't, the bottom line is he was telling them this. This body that's about to be broken is being broken for you. Just like the Passover lamb was being killed and, its pur- and the purpose of it being killed was for the children of Israel, this body is being broken and it's for you. This blood that I'm about to, to, to shed, it's the shedding for the, new, for the establishing of the new covenant for us. So here's the beauty of this, and this is what happens. So as we come forward and we, and we partake of this communion, and by the way, this is for everyone that's here, regardless, because I know there's a big debate today on who can take communion who, and who can't. It's for everyone here. But I encourage you as you come forward, as it, you come and you take the bread and you dip it, and by the way, we have one designated as wine and one designated as grape juice, okay? But did you know in the Seder, the requirement was alcoholic wine? The beauty of this is, as we we do this, what we have to remember is what Jesus did for us at the cross. And when we accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, this is what God done for us in the Spirit. He took the eternal blood of Jesus and He covered us with that blood. He marked us with that blood. And now the beauty of this and what we can rejoice in is this, that when that day finally comes and our life ends, (laughs) we're going to be with Jesus. We're going to be with Jesus. But why are we going to be with Jesus? Yes, because we made Him our Lord and Savior. Yes, because we put our trust in Him and we received Him as our Lord and Savior. But check this out. But if we want to be technical, if we want to be scriptural, it won't be based on when. We're not going to enter into heaven going, look, Jesus, look what I did. Hey, hey, look at all these good works. It won't be that. It's going to be because I'm covered in the blood. It's going to be because I'm covered in the blood. Just as, just as the instruction to the children of Israel was this, When I see the blood, when I see the blood, I'll pass over. The beauty of this is that when (laughs) on that day of judgment comes, the reason that we're not going to fall under that judgment 
is because God's going to say, what sin? What sin? The only thing that God's going to see, the only thing that Jesus is going to see is the blood. He says, when I see the blood, let me get you to stand.